Okay, so yesterday um, we studied this object when written in this form, okay? Now we decided to interpret this as purely a correlation function that we can compute in free field theory. We learned many techniques to compute it. One of them was the weak contractions or the weak theorem <clears throat> which related the time ordering operator or the expectation value of the time ordering of many operators to something that looks like contractions which give rise to Feynman diagrams. And we said that the numerator was given by the sum over all possible diagrams with two external points and at order lambda to the m, because we're going to expand this exponential, so at order lambda to the m, the diagrams would be diagrams with m internal lines. So we said, well, we can start drawing diagrams. We said this was the only diagram that we could have at order lambda to the zero. And then we said, well, we can have we can have a diagram like this. <coughs> at order lambda, but we could also have a diagram like this at order lambda, and we kept going, going, and adding more and more diagrams. Then we decided to rearrange a little bit this series, and we said, well, Let's try to collect everybody that has, say, this diagram. And together with this guy, we will collect everybody that has this and something that looks like this plus something that looks like this, two copies of this diagram, and many, many, many copies of this diagram. Then we said that according to the Feynman rules to compute the actual function of x and y that this thing depends on, this thing would agree with having this diagram and the contribution coming from this thing square, except that we have to put a half due to the symmetry factor. And when we keep going, we will have terms that look like one over n factorial this diagram and this diag the contribution of just a single one of these to the power n. Okay? Of course, there are many more diagrams. So this part of the whole answer can, of course, be resumed into something that looks like e to the this diagram. Okay? Now, what do we want to do? Well, let's look at the other diagrams, right? Now, consider another diagram that looks like this. OK, let's look at this one. Now, consider, well, let me use this symbol, this diagram. And now, together with this diagram, Let's combine this diagram. Okay. Now let's combine the other. Let's combine with this guy another diagram that looks like this. And let's keep going. Combining every single diagram of this form with an arbitrary number of these guys there. Okay. So what do we get from this contribution? We get this diagram times exponential. So we get this diagram times exponential of this guy. Now take any other diagram, anything that you like. Say, say you can take this diagram if you want. <clears throat>
OK? Take this diagram. Now combine with this guy the same diagram, same as here, but now with one power of this guy. Now combine the same diagram with two powers of this guy, and so on. So what do you get? You get this diagram. times the exponential of this guy. Okay? Yesterday, the argument I was using was not correct, and that was pointed out by Amphani, right? Amphani, Amphani. Sorry. Yeah. So at the end of the lecture, Amphani pointed out that the argument I was using was not correct. So it was correct up to this point, of course, where we got this exponential. Then what we really had to do was to collect, pick any other diagram that was not in this set because we already took it into account, then collect all diagrams of this form, exponentiate, take any other diagram, collect all these diagrams of this form, exponentiate. So after we keep doing that, what are we going to find? We're going to find that our correlation function or our numerator is equal to the sum over all diagrams without this diagram times the exponential of this thing. Do you agree? Do you agree? <laughs> yeah, you always use it. <laughs> hmm, that didn't sound like a very convinced <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, so let's repeat the argument. We start, you pick any diagram you like. I like this one because it's the simplest one. So I start with this one. And I collect every single diagram that contains the diagram I picked together with one guy, with one of these guys, two, three, and any number of them. So by the symmetry factors, we pick this. The exponent shade, they give me this. Now I pick any other diagram any other one, which is this guy, say, and I collect it with this set of diagrams. This piece is exponentiate. So I now got this plus this, but this factors out, right? So I have this plus this times the exponential of this diagram. Now I'm going to have this plus this plus this times the exponential of this diagram. So I get the sum over all diagrams without this guy times the exponential of that vacuum diagram. Well, but these guys contain other vacuum diagrams, like this one, say, inside, right? Let's repeat the same argument for this group here, but now in order to remove these guys. This one. Now here, for these ones, I can take this x, y plus x, y, this guy, plus x, y, two copies of this guy, plus any number. So what do I get? From this subset, I get x, y times e times the exponential of that guy. Okay? Now I do it for this one. Say this one together with this diagram, one time, two times, three times, any number of times, and then it exponentiates again. So once again, this guy becomes the sum over all diagrams that don't contain this guy times the exponential of this thing. Okay? So now the next time I get the sum over all diagrams without this guy, and without this guy, and then the exponential times the exponential of this guy. Now I just keep going. Every time I see a vacuum diagram. Oh, from the symmetry factor, right? So yeah, so if you look at this thing, the Feynman, the Feynman rules tell you to compute all the product of propagators, integrate, put the factors of lambdas, all that. 
and divide by the symmetry factor. This guy has a symmetry factor of a half with respect to what this thing would be if we didn't have, if we were taking just the contribution of this guy's square. Okay? And this guy, we have it, well, the nth, the guy with n guys, we have an extra symmetry factor, which is 1 over n factorial. Okay? Because we can permute these guys. So we keep going, keep going, and then you will end up at some point in, well, probably never, right? So you will never end because there is an infinite number of vacuum diagrams. But we can imagine that we finish this process. We will end up with a sum over all non-vacuum diagrams. times the exponential. Now these guys combine. These are numbers, right? So these two exponentials combine. The next one combines with this times the sum over all vacuum diagrams. And we ended the lecture by saying, well, <coughs> the denominator looks exactly as the numerator, except that we don't have these insertions. So this must be the contribution from all the Feynman diagrams that are vacuum diagrams only. And of course, by the same argument, they will exponentiate. And we will get back this exponential. Is that clear? So our master formula yesterday was that the object of interest was simply given by the sum over all diagrams which are not vacuum diagrams. Okay, so that was the conclusion yesterday. Now the same thing can be said for more complicated objects. Well, let's actually write down some of them, right? So now we can simply write this as a contribution from this diagram plus the contribution from this diagram plus higher orders, okay? So life is getting simpler and simpler. In fact, getting rid of these vacuum diagrams was very good because they were actually divergent, right? <laughs> so it was very convenient that we could just cancel them out. However, um, is there a guarantee that these non-vacuum diagrams won't diverge? No, I didn't say that, right? <laughs> one problem at the time. <laughs> Very good. Yes, I didn't say that. So if you consider this one, it's the same, the sum over all possible diagrams that are not vacuum diagrams. And now when we study this, you will see why I don't like to call the diagrams that we get. In some books, and people call them connected diagrams, but I don't like that terminology because in this case, we're going to get diagrams of a form. We already got some of this last time. Clearly, these ones are to leading order, right? These diagrams are the diagrams that we get to order lambda to the zero. 
How about lambda to order lambda? What can we get? Well, we can get something like this. Plus other diagrams where I insert this interaction here in all possible ways to the diagrams that I already got. But is there something truly new that I can get? Well, yes, this guy. And this is the reason why we introduced this four factorial in the, at the beginning of the whole story. Just so that for this diagram, we could simply write <laughs> minus i lambda, right? Now, this guy has symmetry factor one. So if you remember, that was the whole reason we introduced the one over four factorial. Because if we didn't have that, these contractions would give us 24 times the diagram, but then we are dividing by four factorial, so we cancel, okay? Very good. Why is this diagram? No reason, really. Well, you will see at the end, of, hopefully at the end of the lecture today or at the beginning of tomorrow, why this diagram is of particular interest. Yes, yeah, there is a particular, yes. Actually, there is something important about this diagram. But we're a little bit far to seeing why this guy is important. It will turn out that all these things will not contribute to a physical observable that we want to compute. Well, what, what, what do you think is the difference between this diagram and all the diagrams that I've drawn? Yeah, all four are not interacting, that's right. So this is the first diagram that is fully connected, okay? So we're gonna see that these fully connected guys are gonna be very important for us, okay. So, some problems. I know some of you haven't been able to sleep lately, especially uh, you, right? <laughs> due to the problems. But what are some of the problems? Well, the first problem is that at the beginning, when we were doing this calculation in the numerator, we had all these factors of d for z without anything. But these only appear in vacuum diagrams. So these guys are gone. So we don't have any problems. Now the next problem is that even in the non-vacuum diagonals, we have things like this, where we are evaluating a Feynman propagator at z minus z, which happens to be zero in the end. Yes. How do we define this? Well, actually it's ill-defined, but let's just write a symbol for it. And the symbol we're gonna write for this object at the moment is gonna be in the form of the integral representation. So in the integral representation, this thing is d4k over k squared minus m0 squared plus i epsilon e to the minus i. Remember, we had this here. But since we're at zero, this thing is zero, so it's gone. And all we get is just this integral. This integral is ill-defined. Why is it ill-defined? What do you think? Sorry? It doesn't converge. Can everybody see why it doesn't converge? Where it doesn't converge? I mean, why it doesn't converge? What is the region of momenta that will give you trouble? For very large momentum, that's right. For very, very large momentum, this integral doesn't converge. Yeah. 
if k is very, very near zero, this integral is completely fine, right? We have, an, we have a mass term here. So this integral is actually very, very nice. Why, why, why did you think that it was going to give us trouble for a small momentum? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> oh, because you, you, because you face a problem like this in statistical mechanics. Oh, well, <laughs> of course, if you want to get trouble, you can always, I mean, you can always ask for trouble, right? Consider a theory of, of massless particles. <laughs> then you will get your divergence, right? So you want a divergence? Yes. <laughs> you want an extra divergence? Then, then just do it. Right? Of course, in a statistical mechanics, the divergence for large momentum is actually not there because at large momentum, we are exploring what is happening in our system at very short distances. And in statistical mechanics, at very short distances, all the continuous approximations break down and we're thinking about a lattice. So, yes? Given the size spectrum equals to zero, the numerator integral will still take two, and of course, it comes off. Yes, in this case, in this case, it doesn't seem to be, yeah, in this case, it's not divergent, even, even for m equals to zero, okay? But you could have suspected that there might be some problem, and there are other integrals that are divergent when you have m equals to zero. In fact, the first one is when you have four propagators, okay? So in Lorentzian signature, you can show that if you have four things like this in the denominator, is the first time where you have an infrared divergence. It's called an infrared divergence because it has to do with very low momentum, okay? Now, back to the UV, the very high momentum, the very high energy divergences. Indeed, we know here that if we were doing a statistical mechanics, we would be exploring what happens, what happens at very short distances and if there is some kind of lattice in our statistical mechanics system, we will reach the point where we cannot neglect the lattice size, okay? And then integrals will be replaced by a sum, and everything will be fine, okay? But here we're doing quantum field theory, and basically Lorentz invariant tells you that you cannot get away with having a lattice, okay? You cannot think about space-time as having Lattice, lattice points, okay? So what do we do? Well, we just put a cutoff and say, well, something will have to happen at very short distances, which we don't understand, okay? Discretizing space time by this Lorentz? Well, try to think about any way of saying that this point is special and this point is special and these points are special and they, they are all that exist. Try to make a definition of that that is Lorentz invariant. Well, first of all, it's not Poincaré invariant, right? Because it's not invariant on the translations already. No, but it's lattice. Lattice is our translation. Discrete. Discrete translations. Okay. Very good. So we have this problem, we have that problem, and we also have our all problem of what to do with this thing. In fact, in principle, this is not a problem. I mean, we just, this is a definition, I mean, we derive this, and this is the definition of the contour here. It's just that if we want to show that we have something that is Lorentz invariant, it would be desirable to get rid of this, right? Because then these integrals would truly be Lorentz invariant. The integrals that we now have for moment, for a space, in the, egg, in the time direction have this funny shifted contour, okay? So we'll have to fix those two problems. With respect to the cutoff, uh, I can put a cutoff here and everything is fine and everything is good, but so the results which are independent of that cutoff? If they are not, then we're doing something wrong, so right? So we'll put a cutoff and hope for the best. Now you're learning. <laughs> now you're <laughs> After six lectures, yes. <laughs> Excellent, very good. That's the spirit. Did yes. you say that the D4Z integrals uh, went away with the vacuum diagrams? And so I'll start no, the D4 integrals with an integrand of one. Okay. Right? 
Remember, the vacuum diagrams have D4Zs times only propagators that don't depend on the, moment, on, on the position, right? Because they are Z minus Z. So they gave rise to integrals over Z, integrals over every internal point, over the whole space-time of something that didn't depend on that. So that was a very bad problem. But it went away, so no problem. Well, we still have many more, right? Many more integrals over z. All these guys have integrals over z. Right, there is a z here. Okay? So in order to start learning how to deal with these problems, let's go to momentum space. So what do we want to do? We want to take, we want to define a function that depends, that is nothing but the Fourier transform of our <coughs> object, of our two-point function. This is the object we want to consider. OK, well, let's do it. In fact, we know what this function is, modulo infinities and things that we don't understand what to do with them at this point. But at the very least, the first one is very easy to calculate. right? So this object has these two contributions, the first one is this, and this is just the Feynman rules tell us to simply include a propagator or a delta f x minus y for this thing, but this in momentum space is given by d for k, i k squared minus m zero plus i epsilon e to the minus i k dot x minus y. Okay? Now it's very easy to compute the Fourier transform. We just apply these integrations to this, and what do we get? Well, for that diagram, for our first contribution, we're going to get something that looks like integral d for k, k squared minus m0 squared plus i epsilon. There is an i here. And then this guy with x and x here is giving us a delta function, right? It's giving us a delta function that locks p and minus k, or p and k together. Do you agree? That's the integral over x. So this came from x, from the x integration. Now we have to do the y integration. Well, we don't have to, but it would be silly not to do it. So the y integration gives p prime minus y. OK? And that's our answer. Well, it looks pretty good because, first of all, we can carry out the k integration using one of the delta functions, and we get an overall delta function of p plus p prime Yes, thank you. There is a sign. Sorry? Uh, this one. Oh, yes. Sorry, sorry. Yes, there is a K. But it's a plus. So I got the sign right. The letter wrong, but the sign right. OK. So we do the integral over, over K. We get this. And we get I over P squared minus m squared plus i epsilon. So this looks pretty good. In fact, it looks like in momentum space, the object is actually nicer. OK, so there is this guy. Let's do the second one.
The second diagram, so this was the first diagram. The second diagram that we want to consider is this guy. So let's call this two and this one. So let's do number two. So what is number two? Again, we have to write down what it is. So we apply our Feynman rules, it says divide by the symmetry factor, put a minus i lambda times an integration over the internal point for every internal index, for every, sorry, for every internal point. So now it's a z, okay? So that's for the z that we have there. And just put all the propagators that you see. So we're going to put delta of x minus z, delta of z minus z, and delta of z minus y. These are the final propagators. <coughs> okay, so this is the contribution of the diagram. I mean, this is the actual function that we represent by this diagram. But now we want to take the Fourier transform. So what do we do? We, once again, first of all, there is nothing to do with this guy. This guy is whatever it is. These guys we're going to write, again, in momentum space as D4, say, we can call it K1, I, E to the minus I, K1, X minus Z, over K1 squared minus M squared plus I epsilon. And this guy, we can represent as integral D4 K2, say, I minus I K2 dot Z minus Y over K2 squared minus M squared zero plus I S. Okay? So, when we compute the Fourier transform, what do we get? Well, let's get over with this guy first, okay? Let's put it in front. So that guy says an integral D4K or D4L, let me call it L. We need other variables, right? We're running out of variables now. I over L squared minus M0 squared plus I epsilon. And I decided that I'm not gonna worry about this guy. Next. Well, of course, we have our factors. And we have an integral d4k1, i k1 squared minus m0 squared, integral d4k2, i k2 squared minus m0 squared plus i epsilon. And what else are we going to have? We now have to do the integrations over x and y. And over z. That's where the z integration ends. Remember? Good. So let's do the easy ones. Let's do the integral over x. So what does the integral over x give us? Well, it's going to give us a delta function that logs p, it contains p, and everything else that contains an x here. Only here. There will be an integral over y. The integral over y is going to have a p prime. And anything that has a y here, now is a plus k2. And now we have our funny integral over z, OK? Of what? Of e to the everything that contains z. So we have, we can say i z k1 minus k2, OK? Now, this integral <coughs> is really this integral, because we have our funny contour, right? This guy. 
Yeah, I need the I need the colors. But now, if you look at this, you can see that this object can be thought of as somehow a regulated version of a direct delta function. So it's begging you to say, well, just simply take epsilon to zero. It becomes a distribution. That's why from the beginning it was a little bit funny, right? Because its job is really to regulate the distribution. But now that we're doing this perturbation series, it makes sense to treat this object as literally the limit when epsilon goes to zero, when this epsilon goes to zero, and treat this as a distribution. Yes? So the only reason you have to get so many things in epsilon is that they're treating this from a finite function, and so the infinite imaginary part is epsilon to zero. If we then take epsilon to zero, it becomes as many of the angles that we get as they have to be that. You mean the derivation of this formula yeah, relied yeah, on epsilon being non zero? Yeah. Yes. But all I'm saying is that once you compute everything, the quantity that we derive, now the epsilon dependence in perturbation theory, in this object that we're doing, in the, in the way we're evaluating, only enters through this contour. And in this contour, we can simply set it to zero. Okay? Somehow, its job was to regulate the distribution. Okay. What you're saying is, I thought the job was to kill off all the higher. Well, that was a job in deriving yeah. the vacuum, yeah. in deriving the, the correspondence with the vacuum. Yes, indeed, it did something very important. But once we projected out that object, we get something whose only dependence on epsilon seems to be, or whose only job seems to be regulating this distribution. So we just take it to be zero. I guess the issue is that how do we know that the higher terms that we projected out don't contribute? Like the issue isn't with this term, the issue is that we need to keep it Well, to this order, the other terms will not contribute, right? Okay. In, this, in this calculation, it will not contribute. In fact, to any order in perturbation theory, they will not contribute because what is going to happen is every time we get an integral of this form in momentum space, its job is going to be regulate this distribution, okay? To regulate the distribution. Can't you get, get away with that by saying just that without taking the limit that is precisely a representation of a delta function. And when you take the limit, you can epsilon is equivalent to zero plus or minus. No, without. I if you don't take epsilon to zero, this is not a delta function. Yeah, but I'm taking the limit after a good integral, right? So if I have the same. Well, that's the, the, that, that's the whole point that I'm taking this as a regulated version of a delta function. Yeah, okay. yeah. And then when we take epsilon to zero, we just simply get the distribution, okay? Very good. Uh, that epsilon here is not the same epsilon that you have in this proposition. No. Okay. So any other questions? Because from now on, we're going to assume that we don't have that. And this simply give us another delta function. Okay, so who can come out with Feynman rules in momentum space now? Just by looking at that and by looking at this. I'm, I'm sure you can come out with, well, Feynman, yes, of course. Now, uh, yeah, probably all the chalk is, yeah. Very strange. Tibra, Tibra brought lots of chalk yesterday. Somebody stole them. Yes, indeed. Well, okay. Uh, I think we can manage. Okay, so let's try to derive Feynman rules for computing the contribution of a given diagram in momentum space, okay? By looking at this and this. So from two examples, we're going to try to derive the rules. Well, I'm giving you time while I erase this. 
to think about what the rules can be. A Fourier transfer, what you had before. <laughs> Integrate all the axes, and then, yeah, well, that, that yeah. Very good, yes. So that would be the definition of the object. Now we want to find the rules. Okay. Well, let's look again at our diagram. For every external vertex, we put in some momentum, P and some momentum P prime. Right? That's what we did there. We introduced for every point in space time the Fourier transform, so we're basically introducing momenta for every one of them. Now, the fact that each line corresponded to a Feynman propagator, it means that we can think of as having some momentum in this diagram, okay? So this corresponds to the momentum that appears in the Fourier transform representation of this Feynman diagram. So, how can we get the formula that is over there? Well, I can simply postulate or say that the rules are that every time you see, first of all, a vertex, what do I have to do? That's right. For every vertex, I put a delta function that ensures momentum conservation. In this case, it looks very trivial. It says that P minus K has to be zero. Sorry? You basically use the arrow for the direction of the momentum, so that the time in the delta will be fixed? Yeah, so I'm saying, I'm saying all the external guys, I'm taking them to be incoming. That's right. Well, after all, look, I, always, I chose the same sign for the Fourier transform, right? There is no distinction between x and y. These two points are the same, OK? So I have that for every vertex, I put a delta function. So that tells me that I need one delta function here and one delta function here. Okay. So for every vertex, so the rules are starting to shape as for every vertex, put a delta function. What is what what if they're treated entirely equivalent? Yes. Then why do we switch time? Because because K because K because K is an integration variable. So K is an integration variable. The formula is completely symmetric in P and P prime. I mean the diagram is not symmetric. The diagram by itself, because they had to give an orientation for K. So that's what breaks the symmetry. Yeah in the integrand, right? But the answer is, in, is, completely, is completely invariant, right? Because now for each of these guys, every time you see a line, okay? Now we're distinguishing the vertices from the lines. So for every vertex, you introduce a delta function. And for every line that you see, you introduce an integration over the momentum that is there times i, Okay. Of course, this diagram is too simple to give us the next rule, but the next rule should be that if this vertex is an interaction vertex, you should also multiply by minus i lambda. Okay. So each vertex gives you this, and each vertex that corresponds or that is joined to four lines will give you a minus i lambda times the delta function that preserves momentum, okay? Now I claim that with these rules, I could have written down the second answer. Of course, there is one more, which is I will divide by the symmetry factor.
OK. So first of all, do you, do you all see that we get this diagram from this rule? The answer that we have over there, right? We get the integration, which is there, the two delta functions, and that's the answer. That was very good. Now the next one would be, again, you have p, you have p prime, you have k1, k2, and l. That's our second diagram in momentum space. So once we have our diagram in momentum space, you look at it, you apply the rules, so we get one, two, three integrations over momenta, over k1, k2, and l. We get one, two, three delta functions. We get a factor of minus i, lambda, and we get a half from the symmetry factor, okay? But of course, this answer, just as here we got it to be something very simple, we could also get it to be very simple as well, right? It would be silly not to use this delta function to carry out the k integrations. So this will give us our integral, a half minus i lambda. Now these three, these three delta functions are enough to localize these two, okay? So we can use this to carry out this integration, this to carry out this integration, and this last guy will give us what? Will give us a delta function that says, well, this guy is equal to p, and this guy is equal to minus p prime, so it will be p plus p prime. So we get delta four, p plus p prime, okay? And these integrals will be done, and we get p squared minus m0 squared plus i epsilon. And actually, since p and p prime are one minus the other, the p prime that we will get from here becomes p, so we get all these squared. Okay? So the Feynman rules that you will find in books are not these ones, that's why this, I call this one version 1.0. The Feynman rules you will find in books are the rules, are rules that are a little bit smarter. The rules give you this answer already. So can we come out with rules that will give us directly this answer? Well, obviously, the first thing to do is not to do this silly thing that I did here, which is to say that we have a momentum p and here a momentum k1. We know that there is already a delta function here that will lock this p to be this k1, right? So we shouldn't even include this integration. This delta function will always carry out this integration, okay? So in the smarter way, so now, Feynman rules. Second version would be, if you see a diagram, don't even bother to draw these points, okay? Just don't do it. Say that the momentum that goes here is P, the momentum here is P prime, okay? This momentum is L, and then what's the rule? The rule tells you to add, first of all, an overall momentum conserving delta function. What do I mean by that? Well, you see that this diagram had this delta function 
and the diagram on top also had it. Could it be that all diagrams will always have that delta function? Well, the answer is yes. So all diagrams will have this delta function with the external ones. Can anyone tell me the reason? Why would that happen? That's a consequence. I'm jumping ahead. So look, imagine we're doing, we're, we're doing something, we're, we're evaluating this one in momentum space. So we, there will be four momenta. And then there will be, I claim there will be an integration Sorry, there would be a delta function saying that the sum of the four momenta that I use in the definition of the Fourier transform of that guy will have to add up to zero. How can I tell that that delta function will be there just by looking exactly translation invariance? We know that our formulas are translation invariant, right? Well, from the beginning, they are Poincaré invariant, right? In particular, they must be translation invariant. But everything depends on differences of points, right? The propagators are only differences of points. So if we shift everything by a constant vector in a space time, we will get the same answer, OK? That shift is what implies is that this delta function has to be there always, OK? So this is a consequence of translation invariants. OK. So we're very happy we put it there. What's the next rule? Well, every time you see an internal line, So if this is internal, okay, you replace it by a propagator. Okay. Three, you put you integrate, sorry, you put delta functions for every internal vertex. In fact, we could do this already from the start, right? From the start, we can look at a diagram. And instead of putting these delta functions, we say that the diagram actually tells us the flow of momentum, OK? So we could start by drawing the diagram and saying that the diagram has momenta flowing. And at every point, momentum has to be conserved, right? So we could even get rid of this rule. But let's keep it here, OK? And finally, well, almost finally, integrate over any internal momentum not fixed by three. OK? So once again, this rule, this part, could be implemented at the level of the graph immediately. OK? Let me give you another example. Imagine that we have a diagram that looks like this. Um, say, yeah, that's a problem with this theory. There's too many. Imagine we have a diagram like this. OK? So what would the rule tell us? Well, we have momentum, P1, P2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. OK? So this momentum, we can already say that this momentum is fixed because there is, we can remember that there is a momentum conserving delta function here that tells us that this momentum has to be equal to P1 plus P2 plus P3, OK? So we can implement this one already at the level of the diagram. And then simply integrate over anything that is left over, OK? In this case, we integrate over L because this momentum conserving delta function doesn't tell us anything about L. Okay. 
This is internal. Internal means a vert uh, an edge that is connecting two vertices. Okay. Understanding that I remove all the external vertices. Then why do we have the outer and the other two the other two lines? <coughs> oh, yes, that's right. Sorry. Yeah. There is a third version. Yes. Sorry, sorry. So for every ver for every line, yeah. Sorry, I was actually jumping to the to the third version, which we will get at the end of the. Yeah, sorry, it's not the final version. That's why, if I keep <laughs> if I keep putting things like this, it means that there will be a new version. So in this version, you're right. Very good, very good. In this version, we have to replace every line we see with a propagator, even these lines. Is that clear to everybody? I mean, otherwise, my rule will not reproduce this diagram. I miss these two things. Yes, very good. So there is even a fifth rule, which is that we have to put this for every time we see an interaction vertex. We can put it where? Here? In the fourth one. Integrate over internal momentum. Mm, not quite sure. Huh? I think it's safer to say that every time you have a quartic vertex in your diagram, right, a vertex of balance C4, you have to put a minus I land. Yes. Very good, yes. For every inter interaction vertex, I can put it here, so I don't need a new rule. So there is a fifth rule, yes. As you can see, I don't like to impose rules. <laughs> I don't know if it's true for this diagram, but this third rule somehow is uh, the third rule. redundant with the other ones, right? Because, I mean, can I just say that for every line that will show, I mean, for every line I put a propagator and just integrate over, over internal lines? No, that was, that, that was this rule. Yes, yeah, but you're integrating, even, I mean, you're, you're integrating here over L. No, I'm integrating over e any momentum that is not fixed by the previous one, yes. So, I mean, I think I lambda has to be a different rule. We cannot put it in number three because that diagram that you do with fixed external lines, there is no internal momentum because it's not fixed. No, for every internal vertex. Yes. So, so I, so I mean, internal, but it, it really, we remove all the external vertices. So there is not even an internal vertex, right? There is a delta function for every, here I remove, I, you see the problem with putting the minus i lambda here yeah. is that I, I said that graphically we can get rid of this by simply drawing the graph, yeah. right? So that would be a little problem with putting the minus i here if I want to remove this from here, right? So I think, I think I'm going to settle down after all this discussion for saying that we draw the diagram, we impose momentum conservation as much as, as much as we can, okay, from what we see in the diagram, from the flow, okay, and we replace this rule by saying that we just put this factor every time we have an interaction vertex, and we integrate over all the momenta that are not fixed after we do our little game of following momentum conservation through the diagram, okay? And exactly these five rules are the ones you're gonna find in the books, okay? So we ended up converging to these rules, okay? But as I said, there is still another set of rules, but it's for computing something slightly different. Now let's keep, 
going and study a little bit more our momentum space object, okay? Any questions so far? Okay. Sorry? The last thing to the thing. We're going to impose the delta function in the vertices by drawing the diagram. Okay, so let's actually do one more. Say, um, let's do it here. Say we have this diagram. This could have been one of the diagrams that contribute to the four-point correlation function in momentum space, right? So what would this diagram give us? Well, we have the two internal guys, so we put a minus i lambda square, okay? Then we have to, the first thing we do is to apply momentum conservation without doing anything to, to our expression, but only looking at the diagram. So we have that there is momentum conservation here, P1 plus P2, going here, right? But we don't know how to split it. So there must be another momentum that we, don't, we cannot fix by momentum conservation. So we can just call this one L. So what would be this momentum here? It would be, if we define it to go in that direction, it would be L plus P1 plus P2, right? This one would be P4 and this one would be P3, of course. None of this would make sense unless we remember that there is a delta function that tells us that P1 plus P2 plus P3 plus P4 is equal to zero. And then we can apply the rules and construct the rest without having the rule that I had before for the internal vertices. Is that okay? L is not fixed, so you have to integrate over it. Okay? Yes. Okay. Very good. So let's move on. And let's do a little calculation. Well, it's not a calculation, really. It's, a, it's just an observation about our object GPP prime. As we know, this object contains this delta function. So let me define the rest to be something that depends only on P. Okay, so, yeah, I don't know how to call what we're going to do now. Mm. Let's call it, let's call this section pre-summing. Does it matter which direction you put the momentum to go? Because what I have to worry about putting minus L and plus No, it doesn't it's matter. Irrelevant. No, the direction, the direction doesn't matter. I, I can call, I can define this momentum. If I had defined it going in the other direction, then this would have been minus L minus P1 minus P2. Wait, uh, I think it's Indeed, yes. Uh, no, sorry. This guy, oh, sorry. These guys are incoming. This guy is outgoing. So in fact, it should have been, yes. No, even if I change the arrows, it's not correct. Very good, yes. Okay. So what is the momentum going inside is P1 plus P2. So if I want to say that this momentum is going outside, say, it would be P1 plus P2 must be going out. But this guy was going out, so maybe I should have defined this guy going in. It would have been better. And then it's... The previous answer was, oh, you were right. I only had to reverse the, the two arrows, and then you have been correct. Very good. With respect to the kinetic factor, when I put labels on my, my external lines, 
Yes. Exactly in the same way as we did before. Now the symmetry factor is the same as, as the symmetry factor we had before. You calculated it in exactly the same way. In this case, in this case, it could actually be, so you can swap these two guys. Yes. I think it's probably half. So let's expand this guy, OK? We have this term. We have this term. Now the next term would be what? Well, we can have something that looks like this. Again, by momentum conservation, this P has to be the same as this P and this P. Okay. We could also have this guy. We can also have this guy. We had it before. What else can we have? Well, we have tons of things. So to order lambda square, is that all that we can have? Anything else that I'm missing? To order lambda square. It's probably, it's probably what we have. So lambda zero, lambda one, lambda square. Now we can keep going if we want. We can do something like this. And so on. Now, let's do the following. Let's classify diagrams according to the following rule. If you see a diagram here that can be split into two completely disconnected diagrams by only chopping off a single line, then It's funny because I want to give a name to the other guys, not to those, but OK. So let's see which guys are those, OK? Let's distinguish those. So this, I can disconnect into two different diagrams by only chopping off one line. There is no line I can, I can chop here to get two different diagrams. No line here that I can do, a single line that I can do. Here, there are two, two lines even. So I can chop it here if I want, this one here. This one here, OK? So people like to call the diagrams that cannot be split into two. So diagrams that cannot be separated by chopping a single line are called one particle irreducible or one PI. Very appropriate, huh? What about the first one? The what? This one? Yeah. I cannot split into two diagrams, right? What do you mean two lines? Yes, indeed. Yes. Very good. Yeah, I guess logically you're correct, right? That if I'm able, if, if I can chop this line, who tells me that this line is, not dif is different from this one? It looks the same, so why not chop it? <laughs> well, let's see, let, let's see what includes, okay? 
Well, let's actually define more carefully what I mean by, by chopping and what we get, okay? So this guy, right, give us i over p squared minus m0 plus i epsilon, right? Plus this guy, okay. So, so what I want to do is to take this guy and then we're gonna see that this guy give us two powers of this thing. Times something, okay? Times this thing. So let me call it, uh, what notation do I use? Um, so actually, actually, let me call it gamma one for the lack of a, of a better name. That's whatever comes from this guy. Okay, very good. So let me call this diagram, diagram one, this is diagram zero, okay? The next diagram that cannot be separated into two is this guy, okay? So I'm going to get the same two propagators, right? times a contribution from the next guy that I cannot separate into two. So I look again, I say, well, this guy can be separated into two, this one two, this one two. So you have to keep going and find the next one that cannot be separated into two, okay? So try to find out what the next one is. And if you, if you do, write it in a piece of paper, you can show it, and then I can, I can draw it on the black. So the next one, the next one, and there is an infinite number of them, okay? In fact, the next one, well, one of the next guys is actually very simple. In fact, it's this one. <laughs> yeah, we missed that one. So that's gamma three. So we can have gamma four and all of them, okay? So I'm going to give a name to this sum. So people like to call this a circle with a 1PI label in it, okay? So we have this 1PI, and if we have these two propagators, people like to say that you have this guy with two propagators attached to it, okay? So this would be the two propagators. Now this guy is our single propagator. Now we can look at these other ones Okay, and say, well, what do they look like? Well, one of them could look like this thing times contributions that exactly look like these contributions that were coming from the 1PI pieces that I had here, okay? So in a sense, I can rearrange the other diagrams so that I get, say, this diagram times every single thing that I had in the 1PI expansion, okay? So once again, I can rearrange the diagrams and get something that looks like this. But once I have all these guys, I can also put on this side everything that looks like 1PI again, and then get a new contribution that looks like two pieces of one PI connected by three propagators this time. So the whole expansion can be replaced by an expansion that looks very amusing. It's just the free propagator plus this one thing plus Remember, by this I mean an infinite number of diagrams. 
plus this guy plus the contribution where we have three 1PI guys, four 1PI guys, and an infinite number of PIs, of 1PIs. Now, this contribution, people like to call it minus i sigma of p, which is a function of momenta, okay? So this is just a definition of this function, assuming it exists, right? So if you assume that such a thing exists, we're gonna call it sigma p. Okay, so if that's the case, what is our function g hat of p is equal to i over p squared minus m0 squared minus i epsilon plus what do we get here? We get one propagator times i, the, this propagator, times this one pi contribution Plus, this guy has three propagators. One of them, I'll pull it out, as I did before. And then we have this one PI with this propagator, one PI with this propagator, give us exactly the same factor that I have here, but it's squared now. The next diagram will give us one propagator we can pull out, and then we will get three factors of the same thing, and then four factors. In the end, we will get a series. Nope. No, there is no symmetry factors here. Well, the symmetry factors are in the individual diagrams. But once I collect them like this, this is all we have. Okay, so we're gonna have i p squared minus m zero squared. Oops, this is a plus i epsilon. Why did it put minus everywhere? Okay, and then we have the sum over n equals to zero to infinity. n equals zero because we get a one from this term of i, you might, you must be thinking that I'm stupid because I'm not canceling these two factors, i and i. <laughs> but let's just keep them, actually, I'm stupid. Why, why, why not cancel this? <laughs> why not cancel the factor, right? I, mean, this is, I thought there was a deep reason. I'm sure there was, and then I'll regret it. To the end, okay? Now we look at this and say, oh, isn't this nice? <laughs> yeah, it is, of course. I mean, every time you see. <laughs> isn't that this? <laughs> but nobody told you what M0 was, right? So M0 could be very, very large. So this thing could actually be very, very small. Oh, please, a little faith here. <laughs> Remember, this is M0, right? I haven't told you what M0 is. So we get 1 over 1 minus this whole thing, which is sigma of P over P squared minus M squared 0 plus I epsilon. That looks pretty good. So just to compute this object, all we have to do is to compute this sigma, and we're done. Oh, thanks. And now we can go, now we can finish the lecture. We are only five chalks away from finishing the lecture. <laughs> so. How do we know the 
Because M0, I haven't told you what it is. <laughs> Gonna make it big. <laughs> Sorry? That sigma is what? It's not infinite. Well, sigma, sigma is not infinite because remember, we're regulating our integrals with a cutter. Oh, you're saying, could it, be, could it be that the sum doesn't converge? Well, <laughs> you're so picky. And nothing converges, but you make it. So <laughs> we put this guy inside here. This cancels this. And then we get something that looks like minus sigma p plus i epsilon. So isn't this nice? So that's the full answer. It looks like, so this two-point function actually looks like a Feynman propagator, except that in the Feynman propagator, we would put here a mass square. This is what we would do in the Feynman propagator, right? But there, is, there are little problems, like this thing depends on momentum, okay? So it's very tempting. But we're not there yet. So let's keep this for a little bit. And let's actually see. We're going to switch gears in order to be able to use this result. And we're going to go back to the full interacting theory, back to thinking. Ah, this is going to be exciting, huh? Back to thinking about H. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and phi. How about that? I never get why things are funny. <laughs> they are not, but, but, the, the, but then, but then you, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's a sign, it's a sign of desperation in, on my part. Right? So, well, we have to go. <laughs> it's. I think it's an important part of the course getting the joke. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, every time we're thinking about H and phi and the full interacting guys, it's because we're going to make assumptions, right? We don't know how to prove them fully. And we're going to make an assumption about the spectrum of H, OK? So we're going to assume that our full interacting theory has excitations that look like particles, OK? And not only that, we're going to assume that the Hamiltonian has a spectrum that is called nice, OK? So what's the spectrum? Well. Just like there is a Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian is the zeroth component of the momentum operator. So there would also be a three momentum P, say. So we can draw. I wonder if we want to draw it here. Yeah, why not? So we have P and we have the Hamiltonian. Okay, here by this I mean the eigenvalue of the states. Okay, and the same thing here. So we're going to draw the null con, OK? And then say, the first assumption is that there exists one excitation that we can call a particle, which, or there exists a state that we can call a single particle state, which we're going to call, I mean, people, Peskin and Schroeder call it lambda. Zero. So this is a one particle state. Of mass m. And momentum. Zero. OK, zero for moment, zero three momentum and a mass m. So this is otherwise known as a particle at rest. So we're assuming that our interacting field theory has a state that describes 
a particle sitting somewhere and has mass m. I think it's a reasonable assumption. Okay? So where would that particle be in this plot? It would be here. Okay? So there is a particle of mass m not moving and it's just here. Sorry? No, this is a state, right? We don't say that there are states with definite momentum. Yes, but I didn't tell you. It's a particle, it's a particle. One thing is that the state exists and the other one is that you can actually measure it, right? The uncertainty principle is something about measuring, okay? So this is a state that describes a particle of mass m, okay? And it has zero momentum, but if you wish, we don't know where it is in the universe, okay? It has no definite position. It only has a definite momentum, which is, happens to be zero momentum, zero free momentum, okay? Yeah, so I misspoke. The particle is sitting, is sitting somewhere in the universe. So I said here, but I didn't, I didn't really know it was there. <laughs> yes. No, you're, the, 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 yeah, it was completely correct what you said, okay? Very good. So now, if we give a kick to that thing, or we move, then to describe that the same particle, we need another state. We need the states with actual momentum p, okay? But those states will have free momentum p such that p squared is equal to m squared. So they will all sit in a hyperboloid here, okay? So this is a space of single particles, a single one particle states, okay, of definite, of mass m. We will assume that there are no other states that look like that, okay? Our theory only has one such guy and it's all hyperboloid. Then of course, at some point we will reach the two particle states and then there will be a continuum of states with energies that can start at 2m, okay? So there will be multi-particle states. Okay. Yes. Yes. States of different mass. Yes. So here we are assuming that in our theory there is only okay, one. So this theory won't give anything about anti-particles or anything. Like that. It's a real. It's a real. So yeah, that means it's a, it's a real scalar field, and I'm hoping that all of you <laughs> have done or are doing your homework, right? In which you are studying a complex scalar field, and the complex scalar field has two excitations, a particle and an antiparticle. Both of them have the same mass, okay? But in that theory, we have two different particles. Yes? Yeah, it becomes a continuum, right? Because the energy of the system, when you have two particles, can now take any values greater than this. Right? It's a, it's a system of two particles. Of course, in different theories, you could also have bound states, which we have energies lower than this. But for, the, for, our, for our case, let's assume we don't have any bound states, okay? Bound states would be between the one particle states and the multi-particle states, okay? Yes, the total free moment, yes, okay. So if we have that, then what time is it? Oh. I just want to get to the point where we can use our spectacular result over there, okay? So all we have to do to get to something where we can use that formula is to say that is to write the same formula that we wrote in quantum field theory zero, which was basically that in the one particle states, or the, actually, in general, if we know the spectrum, 
we can write the identity or we can write the completeness relation in the Hilbert space of our Hamiltonian as follows. So this is our vacuum. Now we can write the one particle states. And the one particle states, if you remember in QFT0, we wrote them as follows. There we said, well, there was a parameter m, right? In QFT0, we didn't say what it was. We assumed in QFT0 that it was the mass of the particle, but here we see that it's actually the mass of the particle what we have to put in there, okay? This is the integration over the hyperboloid of one particle states. So we can call this lambda the one particle state with momentum k and the one particle k with momentum k. And these ones are relativistically normalized. So they are slightly different from the free particle states normalizations that we had. Do you remember? The, the usual states that we create with a, and with a dagger don't have a relativistic normalization. We derived last week what the relativistic normalization has to be. These ones are assumed to be Lorentz invariant. Okay, not Lorentz, I, the same miss. I, I miss picking again. So these guys, this thing together, these two guys together is assumed to be Lorentz invariant once we integrate over k, okay? This thing is Lorentz invariant by itself. Nobody is asking about the plus. Do you remember what the plus was? So the the yeah, the plus meant the delta function. So this was k squared minus m squared instead of k squared, okay? After all, we are only integrating over the hyperboloid, the upper part, okay? Now, what do we want to do with this? We want to go back to our object. So let's assume, let's take, this is again, I mean, these are the real objects. So let's write this as x0 minus y0. Okay, plus one more term. Let's concentrate on the first term and add to it the identity, insert the identity here, and let's see what we get. So we get Is here. I'm taking the first term. Oh. Sorry. Okay. So let's take the first term. Just two more minutes, and we will get the conclusion we want to actually make use of our formula over there. So there is another term. The next term is an integral d4k delta plus of k squared minus m squared. Now we have this guy with the field phi of x lambda k lambda k with the field y. Okay. Very good. Now, what we have to do is to use translation invariance. Or we use the translation operator to write this as e to the mind, e to the i. Px. So we're going to translate our field. Remember, 
This time we're allowed to say it, right? Because we're using the full Hamiltonian and the full momentum operator. We can now take our interactive field and translate it anywhere we want. So guess what? I'm translating it to the origin in time and in space. Are you always ignoring the higher, like your two partial states? So it makes yes, sense. that's right. So there are more states. So we do that to phi of x, and we do that to phi of y. And then what do we get? We get an integral d for k. Now the vacuum is assumed to be Poincaré invariant. So this guy acting on the vacuum gives you the identity. Nothing happens. So we get phi of 0. Now this guy acting on your one particle state, remember this guy is assumed to be an eigenstate of the full Hamiltonian and of the full four momentum operator. So this guy is going to give us e to the i k dot x. When we do it on this side, we get e to the minus i k dot x, a k dot y, right? Because now on this side, we have to put the minus sign, or sorry, this, uh, this time we get, we get a plus sign, okay? When the operator acts on the one particle state. So this is looking very good. Now this state, we can actually connect it to the state at the origin by acting with it with a translation, sorry, with a Lorentz transformation, with a boost, okay? So we connect it by applying a boost. Okay, here we are assuming that these are the scalar particles. So there is nothing else that we pick up. There is a unitary operator that connects this guy with this, okay? Now the vacuum, of course, is invariant under a boost. So the vacuum, we can write it as u, u dagger. And when we put all this together, we get the action of a boost on phi at zero, okay? But this field at zero is actually invariant under boost. So what do we get? So this is taking more than five minutes. Let's get to that. So let's just, so when, once we do that, this implies is that we get this guy is actually, can be replaced by this guy at zero. And we don't have any momentum dependence. These two factors factor out of the integral. And then we learn that our object, so what is it that we're computing? We're computing this guy. Yeah, this is taking too long. Has a contribution that comes from the first term, right? We're just looking at the first term. And that contribution contains something that looks like this, the absolute value of this, sorry, at zero, the square, times an integral over d for k, delta plus of k squared minus m squared, e to the i k x minus y, okay? Plus the other terms that we haven't done. Now, it's your exercise to show that the other terms 
will actually give us something very similar to this, okay? So the other term, so compute the other term, the contribution from the term y0 minus x0. And then you will find that we get something that looks like this. So let's actually give a name to this object so that I don't have to write it again. People like to call this z. So we get z times this theta function minus y0 times this integral. Plus something else you will compute and you will show that it's actually proportional to the same object plus something else that looks almost like this one multiplied by another step function. And this then, you should be able to show that it's nothing but, what do you think? Yeah, by now we're not thinking, right? <laughs> it's a Feynman propagator. So we have something, this thing actually becomes the expectation value of something that looks like a free theory, right? But now with a mass m, this is the full mass of our particle, right? We don't know what it is. Our theory has some particle of mass m. We can measure it if this was a physical theory. So this will be a physical parameter that we can measure. And this thing would actually become the Feynman propagator. So this object will have a contribution that looks like z times a Feynman propagator. So we will have something that looks b for k over k squared minus m squared plus i epsilon. This i epsilon is implementing the theta func the step functions times i e to the i k dot x minus y. And there will be other terms that I'm not writing, okay? The reason we're doing this is that we want to use our formula for something. We work so hard to get that formula that it would be a pity not to use it. So we got this formula. Now we learn from all this actual discussion that this object, this is g of x minus y, or the full two-point function, has a structure that looks like this. So if we Fourier transform this guy, what, what are we going to get? So what we learn from there is that if we Fourier transform the full physical object, we're going to get something that looks like z p squared minus m squared plus i epsilon plus other stuff. This will be the Fourier transform of this object. This is something that doesn't depend on momentum, so it doesn't enter in any of the discussions. It doesn't depend on x and y, so it's just an overall object. So we learn that gp has this structure, okay? But from our previous computation, we learned that GP was given by something that looks very similar, okay? So how do we put the two things together? Just by saying that the two things are together, we end the lecture, okay? These two things must be the same. How can we use the fact that these two things are the same? Well, it looks very, it doesn't look quite obvious, okay? So let me suggest compare them at the momentum p0 that happens to be equal to square root of p square plus m square. So what happens to this object at that point? Remember, this is what we call omega p. 
or omega k. So if we evaluate this object very, very close to this point, what happens to it? It diverges. And what happens to this object? We don't know. It must, because the two must be the same, right? So it must be that this guy also blows up, OK? So, so how do we ensure that this guy blows up? Sorry, why does it diverge? This. Yeah. Oh, because this is, this p square is p0 square minus p square. And I'm evaluating at the solution where this is equal to 0. So I'm setting the denominator to zeros, making this blow up, OK? This guy doesn't look like it's blowing up. So we have to force it to blow up, OK? So how do we force this guy to blow up? So force p squared minus m0 squared minus sum over p plus i epsilon to have zero at p0 equals to wp. But when this happens, p squared is equal to m squared, right? Well, let's actually do it. So at this point, p squared becomes m squared minus m0 squared. This just became m squared, and this is something evaluated at our special value. So we can call it star if you want. The epsilon is irrelevant for the presence as a rational function. The two must be the same. So we can forget about the epsilon. So we need this to be zero. And guess what? This is then an equation that defines our parameter, which we didn't know what it was. OK? Sure enough, this thing can actually blow up, right? When we take our cutoff, lambda, this object can actually be as large as you want. And then this guy will also have to be as, as large as we want. Yes? Should I be worried that the expression on the left side Sorry, that which expression is real? This one. This one, well, that one has an ion on top of the whole Yeah, the other one does. It's just that I didn't put it. Yes, thank you. That's why you, did, you, you were not surprised by the whole thing, because you were worried about the eye. <laughs> yes, there was an eye, yes. So, do we, uh, so the expression on the right, we know that the Yeah, they don't. They are actually analytic at p zero when p zero takes this value. Okay, there is no other contribution. Yes. So, are we worried about the fact that? The, the, the <laughs> well, that's actually very a very good question. You see that all I did was to impose the condition that the pole, the location of the pole, was the same. Now I should also impose that the residue is the same. And that will determine this thing in terms of sigma and m0 again, right? So this was only the location of the pole. So I made sure that they blow up at the same point. But I haven't made sure that they blow up with the same constant, with the same, <laughs> with the same residue. So I should also make sure that that happens, OK? So this is our first example of a regularization procedure. And in fact, it's going to be our only exam. In the next course, you will study the normalization of the theory. And in any theory, if you're lucky, OK, well, not if you're lucky, but in any theory that you want to study, you will have parameters that enter in the definition of the theory, like m0 and lambda that we had over the, the lambda that enters in the interaction. And those parameters, which we don't know from the beginning what they are, I'll call bear parameters. OK? So this m0 
And actually, I should have used, when we define this, we should also call this lambda zero. So M zero and lambda zero are called bare parameters. Okay? And people were very surprised that you could actually make sense of the perturbation theory when you get infinities all over the place, like the ones we were, we were finding, by simply absorbing those infinities in ways similar to this, by defining physical objects like the pole of the full propagator to be at m, is, m is square, sorry, at the mass of the particle square. So this is a physical requirement. Doing that takes completely what this thing was. And now, well, this guy also enters here. Now something else has to be done so that this one will be correlated with the physical four-particle interaction. So you have to measure, if this was a physical theory, the strength of the interaction, you will get a number. You will measure the mass of the particle. And with those two numbers, you are supposed to be able to make sense out of the whole perturbation theory by absorbing all the infinities in the bare parameters. Okay? Now, would that happen? It turns out that it happens for this theory. But if you have an interaction with phi to the fifth power in four dimensions, such a thing will not happen, okay? You have one more parameter if you want, so the coupling of phi to the fifth, but then it would be impossible to absorb all the infinities in that coupling, okay? So theories where you can do the little miracle that I explained here are called renormalizable, okay? And theories where you cannot do it are called non renormalizable okay? So the theory we are considering, lambda phi to the fourth, is an example of a renormalizable theory. Can you tell me a renormalizable theory in six dimensions? Lambda phi cube. Okay. Why lambda phi cube? Well, I guess you found it by analogy, because in this case, this was a theory that was with a coupling that was marginal. In six dimensions, the coupling that is marginal is a coupling of phi cube. Okay? Phi cube in four dimensions is also renormalizable. In fact, it's even more than renormalizable. It's called super renormalizable. But you will discuss that in your quantum field theory two course, okay? So yes, I think. Well, but yes. So in, the, in, in the lab, you measure a finite value for the mass of a particle, right? So in the case that sigma in star is diverging, and zero has to diverge somehow to cancel. The yes, infinity. indeed. Yes. So if I go back to the Lagrangian and do my action and all of that stuff, and we'll do the right thing, then I have a zero pop up, right? Something that is diverging. So, how can I justify everything I, I did if I'm zero diverging? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. Well, the physical, you, you, simply assume, you simply assume that M0 will depend on your cutoff, right? Mm -hmm. And then the point is that any physical observable that you compute, following the rules that we have just laid down, must be something that can be expressed fully in terms of the mass and the renormalized coupling as well, okay? So it should be something, the physical observables should be something that remain finite as you take the cutoff to infinity, okay? So uh, something that is not clear to me um, in said that a yes. uh, filter is renormalizable if I can do this, right? What do you mean by that? Well, it's renormalized, I mean, not this, I mean, this is, this is a way to define what M0 is in terms of the physical object, right? What I'm saying is that when you do the perturbation theory for a physical observable, okay, for correlation functions that have more fields, you will find infinities, okay? The point is that once you perform this condition, once you fix this condition and you do something analogous for the coupling, then all those things would actually become renormalized at the same time. You don't have to do anything extra. 
Okay? It's very surprising that then the whole theory becomes well defined so once you do this and you do the same thing for the coupling. Okay, so, a theory so maybe we should end here because uh, we, we are over time, then you can ask questions after the lecture.